particularly is so important. Illegitimacy is important, uh, I suppose, for the socialization of, of little girls, but it's especially important for the socialization of little boys. It turns out that if you have large numbers of young men growing up who never see an adult male in their lives doing the ordinary things, going to work every day, bringing home a paycheck, behaving with sexual restraint toward his, his spouse, doing those things that fathers are supposed to do, it turns out that you get chaos. And it, this is not, a, this is not a, a moral statement, this is an empirical statement. And we've had a chance to watch it in the United States especially in the black community where we've had very high rates of illegitimacy now for 20 or 30 years. And once you get that, once you get young males growing up who aren't ready to go into the workforce, who aren't ready to be fathers on, on their own account, uh, all the other problems feed on that. Part, part of my problem with this is that it seems to me that there's an awful lot of people who are, in theory, um, part of families out of wedlock where actually there is a male figure there. It's simply a matter of um, legal formality that they're not married. This is where I think, uh, in Britain, where I hear this argument a lot, I think you've got to take a harder look at your own situation. We know that cohabitation in Britain is pretty brief on the average. It's a matter of a couple of years. That's one thing we know. Another thing we, we don't know at all is, are these males who are cohabiting behaving as fathers? That's the second thing. A third thing we know from the States is, that surrogate fathers in the form of stepfathers or other males who are not the biological father are very problematic too. It is not the case that, uh, that it's... Why are they problematic? Well, I'll just give you the numbers from the states, which is if you look at the outcomes for children, whether you're talking about all the different kinds of sure. problems you might have, uh, there's a big difference between, between children who grow up without a father and children who grow up with a married set of parents, biological parents. There's not much difference between the outcomes for kids who grow up with step parents. It doesn't matter who this bloke is, this, this extra man. It, we are just, and by we I mean social scientists, yeah. are just beginning to understand something that I suppose the rest of society has figured out a long time ago. It makes a big difference that the biological father is acting as a father to his children. All right. Um, another problem, it seems to me, with this is that when you try and connect this with the issue of welfare in particular, an awful lot of these um, single parent families are actually, the vast majority of them, are not people on welfare. They're actually doing okay. They're um, two-thirds or half the way up the income scale. Well, that's not true in the United States. And actually, I'm thinking about Britain now. There is a very, very strong relationship between social class and illegitimacy in, in Britain, extremely strong. And you have very high proportions on benefit. Uh, in the States, it is certainly true that the rates of illegitimacy among women who are below the poverty line before they get birth and women who are above the poverty line, huge gap. So if you're saying, does illegitimacy have a surface relationship to poverty and the availability of welfare, I think that's pretty indisputable. Now, whether it's causal relationship gets, gets tougher. Well, what I was going to ask you is because, after all, there are many reasons why this illegitimacy may be taking place. There's religious reasons, there's cultural reasons, there's moral reasons. I'm still confused as to why you focus particularly on the welfare state as the problem here. Well, uh, you don't have to explain why little uh, young women want to have babies. That's for sure. That's hardwired. You don't have to explain why young men want to sleep with young women. That's easy Ditto. to understand. Yep. Sure. Here's, here's, here's the argument, real quickly and somewhat oversimplified. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are very powerful drives, and what keeps that from happening are a whole bunch of penalties. And part of a social stigma, part of it may be religious, part of it's also economic. It doesn't have to be that the young woman says, oh, I'll get out my calculator and figure out whether I can afford to have a baby. What you need is a situation in which that young woman's own parents are saying to her, you better not get pregnant, girl, because we can't afford it. What the welfare system does is, in effect, cushion that short-term economic problem, remove one of those major blocks, and in an era when the religious and social stigma is also vanishing, uh, that's important. Okay, and your solution is simply to take welfare away from single mothers, yeah? Can you in a word, it? in a word, that's, that's pretty much it. What are these people supposed to do? I mean, what really worries me about this is the spectacle of children living in extreme poverty. I mean, you, I think you talked about this originally when you started as a, as a thought experiment. Yes, I did. Now, now I'm serious. Up, now you're serious. And up there in Congress, 
there are, is, is a Republican Congress which is going to put your thought experiment into practice. Are you not a little bit worried about what the results might be? Th think of it in terms of a set of choices which I want to provide to a woman. All right. The, the first choice, and, and we can talk about the choices for men too, but the first choice is, are you going to engage in sex at all? Is it going to be unprotected sex? Uh, if you get pregnant, are you going to carry that baby to term? If you carry that baby to term, are you going to give the baby up for adoption? Now, at each of those steps along the, the road, there is a choice to be made. And one of the things that I want to happen as a result of getting rid of the welfare system is not just that there be fewer children conceived in these circumstances, though that's part of it. I want a lot more of them to be given up for adoption. Uh, you want great state orphanages? No, to no, be to be given up for adoption at so birth. Adoption. The logic of your position is Fine surely on. that you should be in favor of federally funded abortion. I mean, this is uh, one thing that would uh, remove the dysgenic effects that you uh, will be talking about later. Um, because obviously at the moment, uh, people who can afford it have abortions because it's legal, and people who can't afford it, have great difficulty in raising the money for an abortion. But so, uh, can I take it that you are in favor of no, no, you can't. abortions? No, no, you can't. Well, why not? I, I will, I will, because I think that with something like abortion, where there is a very large part of the population which believes that this is murder, that to take tax money and to subsidize that is uh, beyond what governments should do. The Republicans in Congress have talked about uh, orphanages as a solution to this. Is this part of your thinking? Well, I, f I feel a little bit responsible for this because uh, in an article I wrote about a year ago, I was talking relative to the foster care system, mm -hmm. uh, which is a disaster in the United States. And I said, look, I would much rather have my own child in this circumstance in a well-run orphanage by the Catholic sisters than have them put into the current foster care system. I do not now, nor have I ever advocated taking children away from their mothers for any reasons other than the ones we take them away but from it, now. But, but isn't there going to be a very strong um, cash reason to take them away from their mothers that they're simply not going to be able to survive with those children under your system? A couple of things are going to happen. One is that you are going to have a self-selection process. Who ends up taking home the baby? It is no longer the case as it is right now that, oh, if I take the baby home, I'll have an apartment, I'll have food, I'll have medical care, I'll have the rest of it. This has suddenly become a much bigger issue. And I would argue they're going to have a self-selection effect whereby the young women who do take those babies home are the ones who've either managed to enlist the support of their own relatives or enlist the support of the father of the baby and are likely to be the best mothers. Is there, here's where we get to the nut of the issue, though. After you've had the adoptions, after you've had the reduced number of pregnancies, after you've had the self-selection process, are you going to have women who take home babies and are not able to care for them financially? And the answer is yes, you will. And, and so this, what that and happens, this is, is what the, I this back is to. the point at which first you have, as an object of historic sympathy, that child being such an object. You have a at, at the end of the 20th century a society of immense wealth. When I say the private sector can take care of it, then I, I know the. the the size of uh, frustration, how can this man really believe that? I'm mm -hmm. sorry, if you go back to the end of the 19th century and you look at the extremely sophisticated kind of philanthropy you had in Britain, not just... It was not, pretty not, grim. Not, 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 not Lady grim Bountiful. For a lot not of, late, no, a lot of not, no, go back and take a look at it. Not Lady Bountiful taking the sure. basket of food down, but very sophisticated system. And you translate that kind of energy into the late 20th century well. Then you come up with my final question. All right, you tell me, at the end of the day, are we going to have more children suffering under the system I propose or under the system we have right now? Well, that's what worries me. I mean, and in the United and I'm not sure of the and, answer. And, and, and now, here's, here's where in the United States I will then go through the ways in which the problem is horrendous right now. Okay. Brian Barry, how do you respond to that? Do you think that this is the kernel of the problem? Okay, two points. First of all, um, is this problem of single parenthood, and don't forget that most single parents are still divorced, it's not uh, never married, um, is this such a vast problem? Now, there's no doubt that the raw statistics show that uh, children raised by single parents, and this includes uh, illegitimate children, don't do as well in school, they drop out more, uh, there's more tendency of the boys not to be employed and so on. Now, 
By the time you've knocked out the fact that the parents tend to have had less schooling anyway themselves, and also that they are already raising those children in poverty, then you've greatly reduced this effect because obviously poverty itself has a bad effect on schooling. It means you live in a bad area, bad schools, you can't afford to buy books, you're struggling along, and uh, you can't provide a room, all that kind of stuff. Um, now what's left is not a terribly large effect. And I think that this kind of reaction is just grossly disproportionate to the scale of the problem. Don't forget that most of, the, of these children will finish high school. Most of the boys will get jobs. What we're talking about is a larger ratio of a minority will not. Now, I think that this is just hysterical, this kind of re reaction. Now, the second right, point, just, can I just make the second point about cutting off welfare? What is the effect of welfare on the incidence of this? The best studies suggest it's pretty small. One obvious natural experiment is that in the United States, the real value of aid to family-dependent children has fallen by about a third in the last 10 years, while the number of illegitimate births has continued to rise. This clearly suggests that this is not what's going on. If you make a comparison okay, with Europe, well, let's, let's, where let's put that there are fewer response. illegitimate children. Okay, let, let, let's have a response. Uh, the, 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 the response to the first part is that you will not find in the United States very many scholars on any part of the political spectrum who are willing to argue anymore that this is not a serious problem independently of poverty. Uh, there is now something very close, is there, is, there is now something very close to a consensus that the fact of the large numbers of children growing up without fathers is in itself a serious source of the problem. Second point is problem? you're on we, the, the whole variety of ways in which kids do worse. But the second point is that the, that in terms of the causal relationship what the studies show is as follows, and again, I'm talking about studies that have not really wanted to find an effect of welfare on illegitimacy. There is an effect, and it is usually expressed in the following way. Oh, if you had a 10% reduction in welfare benefits, it would only produce uh, a, uh, an 8% reduction in uh, single births. No, much less than uh, no, 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 no. This is, this is the main line finding of a bunch of studies. I'm sorry, sir. I, this literature is I what, read it too. It is, is what I have reviewed in print, you may also go to. The point is, if that's what you get with a 10% change, what do you get with a 100% change? And the second thing is another natural experiment, uh, or unnatural, in, in uh, New Jersey, where you just didn't have reductions because of cost of living changes. You actually said you will not get $64 additional payment if you, don't have, if you have another child. The second child uh, births went down by 20% in New Jersey. And that was data looked pretty strong. Right. So now, I'd, like, no, I'd like to move on mm -hmm. now to mm -hmm. the second part of the thesis, the new book, The Bell Curve, where you have added something new into the equation. Why are you so convinced that success in life and IQ are closely deterministically related? Because, um, for instance, I know lots of relatively well-off, very rich people sometimes, who are not particularly people of high IQ. They've got charm, they've got luck, they've got... Um, a certain grit and determination and courage, but it doesn't seem to me to be an exact correlation between IQ. Well, a couple of points. One is Dick Kernstein and I don't think there's an exact correlation either. Uh, rather, we are saying in this book very definitely that you are looking at statistical tendencies, and the, the issue is not to go out and point at that person and say, ah, that person has an IQ of 87, therefore I know things about that person. Rather, we're saying you cannot understand what's happening in American society at the top or the bottom unless you understand these, these powerful forces. But let me, let me talk specifically about something like job performance. All right. uh, there is a, a well-demonstrated relationship between IQ, independent of education, and job performance. It's a big enough relationship that it has importance to an employer, for example, and it's a big enough relationship so that Whereas you can go out and make a million dollars if you have a very average IQ, uh, it, it, it's going to be very, t it's going to be increasingly tough for you to go out and make even a real good living if you have an IQ of 80 or 75. That kind of that kind of relationship. Right. Now the extra ingredient, of course, in all of this, which has caused the, the storm here, um, is the um, parallelism people at the bottom of the IQ scale with blacks in particular. Uh, point number one there is a difference in test scores between ethnic groups. That's not within dispute. Point number two is, it is not an artifact of cultural bias in the test. Sure, but, but can I just stop you there? Because what is in dispute, as you acknowledge in the book too, is that there is necessarily a correlation between 
IQ, intelligence, and heredity. Each of those links you yourself accept is wobbly, That's say the least. Well, the, the relationship between heredity and IQ in human beings is well established. But that does not mean that if you have a group difference, such as an ethnic difference, that that difference must also be genetic. And one of the major statements in the bell curve here is, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference whether it's genetic or not. It's not nearly as important as issues. It makes things. a lot of mental difference. It makes a difference about how people regard one another. I, I, I know it does. When we put that section in there, Dick Hernstein and I did that for a very explicit reason. It was our view that every time we talked to people about race and IQ, this whole business of genes was at the top of their minds. Yes. And they seemed to think that, oh, if the difference is caused by the environment, that's good news, because we can fix that. Whereas if the difference is caused by genes, that's terrible news. And we say, wait a minute. Just because the difference is caused by the environment doesn't mean it's meaningless. And it also doesn't mean it's easy to fix. And just because it, might, it, it might mean, if I may say, it's a much bigger social programs. It might be a liberal left conclusion for a liberal left oh, social that's agenda. absolutely true. Well, but, uh, let me say, say more generally, you may take this entire book and say, oh, well, this, this is a justification for a Rawlsian state where we redistribute because people come up on the short end of the IQ uh, yep. stick for no fault of their own. Absolutely. Uh, but that having been said, we thought that that discussion of genes and race would help defuse the issue. Uh, I think in the short term we were certainly wrong. I mean, this, there's been an eruption. You were, you were wrong to in say the, it. In, in the short term. But in the long term, I think that we will prove to have lanced a boil in this country because the underground conversation about race and IQ, people whispering behind their hands, that kind of thing, has been so misinformed. But people will be saying as a result of this, perhaps as a result of bad reviews of it or whatever, but they'll be saying, there you are, we always knew it all along, the blacks are not as clever as we are. And that can hardly be called lancing a boy. I think that in the long term, what is going to happen is that people are going to come to grips with human differences, whether racial or otherwise, in ways they have not. And I guess our strong feeling then, and my feeling now, is that the failure to do that was building up pressure in the society, whereby people were paying lip service to certain things nobody believed anymore in terms of equality. And it's essential that we start taking a humane, but much more realistic view of how human beings sort out. Brian Barry, your reaction to that, is it even fair enough to you? I don't think anybody in the least denies that there are correlations between different pencil and paper tests and that in the sort of society that we have nowadays, doing well on pencil and paper tests is going to tend to tie up with getting a good job. I mean, there's a very close relationship between that and the kind of scores that get people into universities, and then there's a high correlation between that and the kind of degree they come out with, and then there's some correlation between that and what kind of job you get. Although, let me point out that uh, Michael Young, whose Rise of the Meritocracy doesn't manage to figure in the 57 pages of bibliography here, although basically the whole book's a rip-off of it, um, actually said that um, merit was IQ plus effort, and effort does actually make quite a difference. Anyway, let's, let's concede all that. Now, what follows from it? What follows from it is certainly that, let's suppose that we take your figure of 60% uh, heredity. Okay, the other 40% is not heredity, and the other 40% can be done something about. Now, you say Head Start, for example, dies away. Well, if you look at conditions in the ghetto, I'm not surprised it dies away. The question is, haven't the blacks really in this country done rather well. I think they have. That's to say, if you consider that until the 1940s, 50s, when they started migrating to the north, they were basically living in conditions of serfdom. The sharecropper system was kind of feudal system. Uh, more or less zero education, complete demoralization of, of the uh, black males particularly. Um, and I think that the black population in this country has done rather well. You've only got to compare it to what people were well, saying let's, let's about Eastern that, right? Europeans in the 1920s uh, as a result of which racist immigration legislation was introduced, co corresponding exactly to the kind of racist immigration okay, well let's, I mean, legislation you want, to see that this thing is just what happens to people who are marginalized within the current state of society. Well, we have data uh, to talk about. I mean, if, if the statement is that the blacks have done quite well in all sorts of ways, I would agree with that. But if you then say, well, is there in the black-white difference in these paper and pencil tests, 
uh, is this difference uh, equally predictive? I mean, excuse me, are the tests equally predictive of job performance, of academic performance? Yeah, they are with blacks okay, and whites. Uh, uh, and so, and so, and, and furthermore, if you say has there been convergence, there ha there has been modest convergence, which has slowed down, and you're ending at this point with with still a, a quite large gap. And if you're saying that we don't have to get hysterical about the black-white difference, believe me, that is our view as well. Uh, that does not mean that the gap that exists is inconsequential. Let's come on to um, the question of solutions and where you think America is going, because you've argued that. Um, there's something called, which you call dysgenesis, which is if we carry on, if you carry on like this, then America is going to get, as it were, stupider. That um, there's, there's because, because it's a downward pressure. Th there's a downward pressure because people at the bottom end are, to put it brutally, breeding more than people at the top end. Now, what I don't understand was if that was to be the case, why are IQ rates going up, not down? Well, in the United States, it depends on who. See, the IQ rate going up and down is not necessarily a function, as we said earlier, of, I, of, of intelligence as such. Sure, but, we know, we but, but you base an awful lot of the book on the IQ tests. Well, but that's one of the reasons that when we talk about this genesis, we say not that the population is definitely going to get stupider because you do have these countervailing trends. What we say is that if you have more parents with low IQs having babies than parents with high IQs, yep. you have a downward pressure that has to fight uh, uh, a, a variety of other factors which are at work. Having said that, though, if you go to the last chapter where we talk about solutions, Dick Kernstein and I are not up in arms about the need to reverse dysgenic trends. That, we don't think, gets at the core of the problem raised by this book. The core policy problem can be put as follows. No matter what we do, we are going to end, you are going to have a bottom end of the distribution that is economically less and less uh, likely to succeed. How do they live satisfying lives? But this is where it connects in a lot of people's minds to your agenda and welfare. And they say that you are merely reviving the old social Darwinist agenda, that there are stupid people at the bottom, and you would like um, them to breed out. You'd like them to die out as a group because they're holding America back. That's the you basic know, charge against you. I know. And we have, with regard to getting rid of welfare programs we talked about a minute ago, there is one sentence in the last chapter which says mildly that Dick Hernstein and I are generally in favor of getting rid of these programs. Look, you can take somebody at the low end of the scale, and we know we can give them enough money to get them above the poverty line. That's a mere matter of distributing uh, uh, the sufficient number of pound notes. The question is, how do you structure society so that that person has an important, valued place in the community? So you regard these people at the bottom as important and valued people. You're not yes. saying that they're causing a problem for America. And in fact, I would like to think that as time goes on, that will surface from this book. This book is neither enamored of people with real high IQs. On the contrary, we are extremely uh, nervous about what they're doing. And the second part is we're saying, look, the, the, the key thing is not to get enough money into people's hands. The key thing is to have a, a place where they can reach the age of 70 and be proud of who they have been and what they have done. Charles Murray, Brian Barry, thank you both very much. I think we've shed a little bit of light and a certain amount of heat on the issue. And this is something we're going to be hearing an awful lot more about, I suspect, over the months and years ahead. Thank you both. Thank you.